the loss of everything that constituted the happiness in her life left Puja Khan in a downward spiral. Life had lost its appeal and she did not want to live another day without the only people who had allowed her to smile. Coming out of her coma, she was plunged into the reality that her life was now bereft of any value, of any love or of any intimacy. She felt as if she was cursed. Nothing good had ever lasted for it would always be taken away from her. Suicide became a very attractive option, and she found herself moving in that direction. It was not that she did not have the will to do so, she could not find anything to kill herself with. After all, this was something new she had never thought of before. She somehow figured that the easiest way for her to achieve her goal was to place herself in the path of a speeding car or to have someone shoot her. She knew of no other way. When she was discharged, Puja expected to be able to return home. Once there, she would find someone to help her exit an empty whirlwind of lifeless existence. One of her plans was to hire an assassin off the street. When the FBI barred her from returning, the threat of the Somalis returning to finish the job imminent, she had hardly expected to have to stay away for six months. Without her consent, the FBI took Puja Khan from the hospital directly to a remote town, which was located many miles away from the city where she used to live. The town had a mere 80 residents. Most of them were aged or retired government employees. It had a small market. Everyone in the town knew each other. The locals were not surprised to see Puja Khan with the Lewinskys as they were used to them housing guests. Mr. Benjamin Lewinsky had 40 years of FBI service under his belt before he opted for retirement. In essence, he provided outsourced secure safe houses for high-profile FBI informants and witnesses. Whenever the FBI needed a safe house for a witness that was being threatened, and security was at the level where they needed the utmost secrecy, they would refer them to an external program and special unit, for which no internal records were kept. Mr. Lewinsky had long since volunteered himself as a protective custodian and his home as a safe house. Every now and then, he would be charged with protecting a very important but frightened material witness or informer and he would be paid well for his services. When Puja arrived at the Lewinsky's house, she was stumped. The family had an old barn with horses and an old beat-up truck. Hardly any traffic or vehicles could be seen in the little town. There was a small church with a school bus, used to ferry parishioners from their homes to church on Sundays. During the school week, the bus would serve to take the few children of the parish to their school in a bigger town nearby. Apart from that, the small market vendors used small tractors to bring their produce from the outlying farms. The inhabitants spent most of their time in their houses and hardly anyone could be seen walking on the streets during the daytime. At night, the whole town went to sleep as early as seven o'clock in the evening. In the beginning, Puja felt as if she had been cast out of the world and onto a new planet in faraway galaxy with no inhabitants. She was truly in exile. It was worse than jail. She hated the place because it did not have what she was looking for. She wanted a crowded city where she could step off the sidewalk into the path of a speeding car and end it all. She concluded that her misery and agony would never end. Whenever anything good happened in her life, someone or something had to come along and destroy it. She must have been cursed at birth. During her first month's stay, the old couple tended to her basic necessities, giving her food and shelter. She refused to interact with the Lewinskys and so they left her alone with her grief, thinking that it was the best thing to do. In that first month, they had taken her to the synagogue four times, which was only a couple of blocks from their house. Mrs. Lewinsky tried to claw her back into the land of the living by inviting her along for her morning walks, but Pujar refused the offer. Mrs. Lewinsky, as patient as a mother of four could be, then tried to interest her in accompanying her to the marketplace so that they could stock up on her favorite foods, but she flatly refused that, too. After many attempts, the old couple wisely decided that they should leave her alone to mourn and wait till she was ready to come out on her own terms. 
It was during the holiday season that Puja suddenly changed her mind and came out of her room and joined the family in their evening prayer. Michael happened to be home at that time. There were only a few months separating Puja and Michael. Michael was enthralled with the sight of Puja. He could not believe his eyes when he first laid eyes upon her. He told his parents in front of her that he had never seen such a beautiful girl. His compliment did nothing to touch a broken heart. She did not come into her mind to even thank him. Puja just came in and sat quietly with the family. Mrs. Lewinsky expressed her joy at seeing their house guest join them. For them, it was a victory of sorts. Then, she introduced her to their grandson. Michael stood up and offered his hand to her, which she promptly refused, instead clasping her hands together in front of her face in the traditional Hindu greeting and said, Namaste. Michael was not the least bit offended and politely smiled and drew a chair for her. She positioned herself in the chair and Michael sat in the chair directly in front of her, trying not to stare. Fifteen minutes into the dinner, Puja had not spoken a single word. Her responses to all questions was with a polite nod of her head and a beguiling smile left no doubt that she understood what was going on. At that time, Michael observed Puja carefully, trying to read the enigma seated before him. After the dinner, Puja smiled to the family and walked straight to her room without saying goodbye or good night. Although, her behavior seemed a little odd to Michael. His grandparents were visibly happy with her participation in their first meal together since she had arrived. That night, Michael spent a while lying in bed thinking of Puja. Her behavior puzzled him and her silence was deafening. He could not relate to what his grandparents had told him about her devastated life. He knew there was more to it, simply more than meets the eye. He possessed a shrewd and analytical mind and he brought his inquisitive mind to bear on the issue. Through her smiles, her eyes belied a mind clouded with dark and sad memories. He saw a wavering image of a young girl shaken by life's traumas. He yearned to talk to her and find out more. As was his habit, Michael's visit to his grandparents' house always led to a horse ride. He loved riding his grandpa's horse and the beauty of the open countryside beckoned him. There was nothing he enjoyed more at home than to savor the beauty of nature and the open landscape from his saddle. The next time he came was on a Friday. Early the next morning, he saddled up and went for a long leisurely ride. When he returned he noticed Puja standing by the window of her room watching him. He waved his hand to her and she waved back. He felt like he had finally established some slight rapport with her. The vision of her smile and her gentle wave stayed with him long after she lowered her hand. Encouraged by her friendly response he raised his voice and called for her to come out. He half expected that she would either apologize or just ignore him. He watched as her face disappeared from the window and minutes later, she walked through the door frame and toward him, closing the distance between them. Michael tentatively asked Puja if she would like to go for a horseback ride. Puja spoke for the first time several words. She expressed a desire to but had never been on a horse before. Michael smiled and offered to coach her along. Finding her agreeable, he eased her up onto the saddle and slid in behind her. Puja did not have this in mind and was a little uncomfortable with the body contact. She felt as if she was sitting on his lap. She considered asking him to dismount but was worried that she would fall right off the moment the horse twitched. Before she could say anything, Michael nudged the horse with a practiced kick and the horse obeyed his command. Michael eased the horse into a canter, then a trot. Before long, he had the horse in nice easy gallop with his left hand encircling her while his right hand held the reins. Puja felt his arm ringed around her waist and holding her tightly like a baby he was afraid to drop. After a mile down a lonely country road, he eased to a stop. Puja heard Michael's voice talking near her ear. He began his instruction with seven basic techniques. Take one rein in each hand, the left rein in your left hand, and the right rein in the right hand. Grab the reins with all four fingers, 
with the reins coming in through your pinky and coming out at the forefinger. Hold the reins in place with your thumbs against your forefingers. Hold your hands in the thumbs up position, with your palms slightly downward and thumbs turned toward each other. Hold your hands no farther apart than the width of the horse's neck. Keep your wrists and fingers relaxed. Let your arms and elbows hang naturally, but don't let them droop. Hold the reins as if you are lightly squeezing a sponge. Keep your hands about an inch in front of the saddle and a few inches above the horse. Lift your thumbs and let the reins slide out to add length. Shorten the reins by using the other hand to take up the extra length. Before Puja knew it, the introductory lesson was over and Michael had taken her quite a distance. A very beautiful lake lay before them. Puja took her time to take in the verdant green blanket around the crystal clear blue-tinged lake. The blue lake seemed like a good place to go swimming she mused. As their mount moved along, she realized that Michael was more interested in teaching her how to ride the horse. He did not linger at the lake, and after a few minutes hurried her up into the saddle again and jumped in his place behind her. It was hot and sunny by now and Puja began to sweat. As he held her hands to the reins, the moist perspiration from her body and his cemented them together. The combination of the horse's canter and his warm body to her back gave Puja a rushing desire to have him. She was thinking not to refuse him if he had wanted to take advantage of her. His manner was gentlemanly, so she gave him no indication of the gamut of desires running through her. She longed for his hands touching her breasts and satisfying her arousal. She wanted him to hold her in his arms and kiss her lips and love every inch of her body the way her Jamal had loved her. As they drew closer to the house, Puja knew that Michael would not fulfill her desire that day. She wondered how a boy could come so close to a girl and touch her body for more than two hours without feeling anything. Although Puja did not get what she wanted, she was excited to have ridden a horse for the first time. It helped her to come out of her shell and embrace life after so many days of self-imposed isolation. Having dealt with more suffering and tragedy than many people in a lifetime, she felt that Michael was an angel that God had sent to her. In the Jewish synagogue, Puja heard that the God of the Jews sometimes sent his angels to help his people. That day once again she came down from her room and joined the family for lunch. After lunch, Michael invited her to go with him to the market. She smiled and nodded her head in agreement. Michael's grandparents noticed the sudden change in the gloomy, introverted girl who seemed to be responding to their young, handsome grandson. Puja felt disappointed when Michael told her that the market was so close to their house that they could walk the distance. She wanted to ride tandem with him once again. But, off they went with Michael breaking the silence by talking about himself. She felt touched and so sad when he told her that he had been abandoned by his biological mother a few days after he was born. He told her that he was indebted to the Lewinsky family for adopting him and bringing him up as their own son. Puja hesitated to tell him about her abuse and misery. She told him she lost her Muslim mother when she was just seven years old and when she grew up she was adopted by a Hindu woman. Michael was naturally curious about the time period between both mothers but Puja did not elaborate. Any question about her childhood was rewarded with a quiet willful pause. Michael thought better than to question her further about her childhood and changed the subject. After all, he did not want to ruin the mood. When they reached the market, Michael took Puja to a small restaurant selling snacks and bought her a soda. After that, he took her around the market and showed her many things and handcrafted gift shops. He knew the small town in and out, explaining this is where he spent his childhood and how he knew each and every person by name. He even introduced her to some of his friends. Puja discovered that everybody liked Michael. He seemed to be everyone's friend. Michael promised Puja that on his next visit he would take her to visit the homes of some of his friends. When they returned to the house, Puja's attitude towards the Lewinsky's changed. The old couple could see a different person in her. 
she looked so happy and actually began to speak to them. She did not go to her room, but remained in the living room until dinner time and even had dinner with them again. The following morning, Puja did not wait for Michael to invite her to go riding with him, she was already waiting for him. She asked him to take her for a ride and Michael gladly agreed. She assumed the same position as the day before and Michael assumed his. His touch along her back and hips seemed more pleasurable now that her apprehension was diminishing. Michael did not concentrate on her horse riding skills, he was more interested in talking to her. He asked how long she would be staying with his parents and where she would go when it was time for her to leave. Puja told him the truth that she had no idea, and that she had no one left in her life to go to. She confided in him about her suicidal thoughts when she first arrived and told him that she'd had no will left to live, hoping that someone would run her down with their car. She also told him of her alternate plan to get someone to shoot her. Michael admonished her gently, reinforcing that there was always hope in life. He began to tell her about his religion and how God created people to live and not to take the lives of others, that suicide would be wrong and committing murder against oneself. When they reached the lake, Michael told Puja more about God and his religious faith. Puja told him that she had never heard anybody talk so much about their religion and praying to God until she met him and his family. Everywhere she went people took advantage of her. The only person who had given her everything she had ever wanted in life was her late husband, even though she had never seen him praying or heard him talking about religion or God. Michael explained to her the importance of having faith in God. For the first time, Puja saw a man engrossed in his love for God and who cared enough to talk to her without being distracted by her beauty or her body. Michael seemed very different from the men that she had come in contact with before. She had known two types of men, those that were only interested in pleasuring themselves and one at least that loved and cared for her. Oddly, Michael did not fit into any of these two types of categories. Before meeting him, she always assumed that men were drawn to her because of her beauty and for sexual gratification. It puzzled her that she did not have that affect on Michael. He only seemed to be interested in talking to her about his faith and his relationship with God. When they returned to the house, Michael proposed to teach Puja how to play a guitar. He had a guitar, which he played during the prayer sessions, and his grandparents would join in. Puja liked the idea and sat near him on a love seat in the living room. Once again, she felt the touch of his hands on hers as he showed her how to hold the guitar and how to coax music out of its strings and frets. Puja enjoyed being so close to him and was becoming accustomed to the intimacy. She liked his thick voice and his strong, stocky build. Michael was tall and a very handsome young man. Contrary to what his muscled exterior would suggest, he was very gentle. Puja had told him while riding that afternoon how much she liked his hands as they held fast the reins. Michael smiled and told her that she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen in his life. Puja reveled in the compliment but did not reveal that she was once crowned Miss World. She just smiled, basked in the attention, but suddenly felt shy. Puja knew that Michael had begun to grow fond of her and she could not deny similar feelings for him. What bothered her was his behavior. She wished that he would kiss her on her lips and express his desire for her. She wanted him to make mad passionate love to her. She remembered sitting close to him on horseback and feeling his erection grazing along the side of her lower back. While the horse was galloping, she could feel it rubbing against her body as his hand was wrapped so tightly around her, but, he never went beyond that. He did not kiss her or touch her breasts. If he had, she would not have resisted. That night Puja remained awake for a very long time thinking about Michael. She knew that she had fallen in love with the gentle giant and that this love had restored life in her. Coming out of a foggy haze of depression, Death was constantly staring at her from all different directions. Death for her was the end of love, hate, good and evil. At this moment in time, she no longer wanted to kill herself. She no longer thought that Michael was a godsend. 
she knew he was. Her life had been based on the need to survive. Everything she had learned so far was based on need. There was no time or place for morals or things of a religious nature. The concept of sex within the sanctity of marriage was unknown to her. She could not appreciate that for some, this was the way it was supposed to be. Her first marriage experience was clouded with rape and abuse. Her second captor did not even bother to marry her. He just treated her as a kept wife, tortured, and abused. Her first real love affair was based on a mutual or reciprocal interest. It was a give-and-take relationship. From day one, she knew that her lover was a married man and still she did not hesitate to sleep with him, eventually agreeing to marry him despite the fact that he was already married to another. Her fourth experience at matrimony was an arranged marriage and based on the selfish interest of her Hindu husband. All her experiences with men were based on some selfish indulgence. Puja extended her values to Michael, expecting him to initiate sex with her. What did marriage have to do with it? Lying in bed one night, she decided that it was time to seduce him. She would just have to tempt him and put him in a situation where he could not avoid having sex with her. The very next day, she packed clothes into a small handbag. When Michael asked her what she was carrying in her bag, she told him it was a surprise. Michael did not try to figure out what kind of a surprise she had in store for him. He just helped her to climb onto the mare and he jumped in behind her. Everything went as before until they reached the lake. She could feel his erection nudging her back as his arms girdled her tightly. When they reached the lake, she asked him to close his eyes and he should not open them until instructed otherwise. When she was satisfied that he was not peeking, she opened her small handbag and took out what she brought with her. Then, she looked all around and when she did not see anyone, she stripped off all her clothes including her underwear and bra. She put on her bikini and eased herself into the lake. Once in the water up to her ankles, she shouted at him and told him that it was now okay to look. When Michael opened his eyes, he saw her standing by the water in her sexy bikini. She looked simply marvelous to him and extremely sexy in her swimsuit. Michael expressed his desire to swim with her but regretted she did not tell him of her plans before leaving the house. He let his response taper off before telling her that she looked absolutely beautiful and definitely hot in her string bikini. Puja wasn't the least bit interested in modeling her swimsuit or swimming. She just wanted him to see what she looked like. After soaking for a while, she slipped out of the water, came to him and reminded him that he should bring his trunks tomorrow and join her in the water. Then, she picked up her towel and began to towel off. She turned around and asked him to do her back. Michael took the towel and began to dry her body. He knew that she was trying to tempt him and wanted him to touch her body. When he finished drying off her back, he told her that he was going to close his eyes, turn around, and allow her the privacy to change. Puja became very disappointed when she saw his face turning away from her. Things had not gone according to plan. She felt that he was rejecting her and that he did not share her feelings in return. When she removed her bikini and put on her clothes, Puja felt a tinge of anger when he motioned for her to sit with him and he began to speak to her about his religion and God again. 